Mr. Zuckerberg, if you've messaged anybody this week, would you share with us the names of the people you've messaged? Uh, Senator, no, I would probably not choose to do that publicly here. I think that may be what this is all about. Your right to privacy, the limits of your right to privacy, and how much you give away in modern America in the name of, quote, connecting people around the world. So not here a warning about Facebook and what some believe it's doing to kids. The warning comes from two of the company's earliest executives. We kind of knew something bad could happen. Chamath Palihapitiya, a former Facebook executive once in charge of user growth, now says he has tremendous guilt about the social network he helped build. We have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. Former Facebook president Sean Parker recently said the initial goal was to get people hooked. You're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. The inventors, creators understood this consciously and we did it anyway. People need to hard break from some of these tools and the things that you rely on. The short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops that we have created are destroying how society works. No civil discourse, no cooperation, misinformation, mistruth. Bad actors can now manipulate large swaths of people to do anything you want. We know that Google is tracking us. We agree to it when we set up our phones. So we wanted to figure out what exactly Google is learning about us throughout the day. So here's what we're gonna do. We have two identical phones. The only difference between these two phones is this one is in airplane mode. Both of the phones lack a SIM card and they haven't been set up to access any Wi-Fi networks. So for all intents and purposes, these phones have no connection to a data network. We're gonna keep them with us throughout the day. And while I travel around DC, we're gonna figure out just what Google is finding out about me. Our tour around town was a 14 mile journey that lasted more than an hour. The entire time, the phones had no access to the internet. Oh my goodness. Not a Wi-Fi connection and not any cellular data service. It almost seemed quaint to assume that Google wouldn't even be able to collect data on me. Both of our phones, exactly how we left with them. So let's find out what they know. This is our man in the middle device. It's basically a Wi-Fi network that these phones are going to connect to once we turn their Wi-Fi on. It's going to pass data through it on the way to Google. But on the way, we're actually going to get a copy of the same data that Google's going to get. We'll be able to decrypt it and then find out where we've been throughout the day. Within minutes, the numbers rolled in. The phone that wasn't on airplane mode registered more than 100 locations, 130 activities, and even 152 barometric readings. As soon as it hooked up to our Wi-Fi, it transmitted 300 kilobytes of data straight to Google. The phone even logged our exact locations, tracking us all around town, the Capitol, the hospital, the school, and the cathedral. Now you may notice what's missing here is the exact route that we took, but it got that data too. It knows when I got out of the car. The metadata has a time log down to the very second, tracking everything when they think that you're walking, riding, and yes, even getting out of the car. Okay, so you're thinking, this isn't a big deal. I'll just put my phone in airplane mode. Yeah, we thought of that too. This is the other phone that we had with us that no SIM card also remained in airplane mode the entire time. Let's see what kind of data it captured. The phone with airplane mode activated actually logged more locations and activities than the other phone, and it also transferred hundreds of kilobytes of data to Google as soon as it was activated. The only thing that's missing from this map is our stop at the children's hospital, but it still knows we were there. There it is, exiting vehicle, 100% accuracy, through complicated user agreements and free software, Google gets users to sign away their privacy for nothing. The fallout is already hurting Facebook. A billionaire tech entrepreneur, Elon Musk, deleted his personal page and those for his SpaceX and Tesla car ventures. Well, WikiLeaks editor Julian Assange has also lashed out at the social network on Twitter. Others are rushing to do the same too, with the hashtag delete Facebook trending. So when significant stress starts to show up in their lives, they're not turning to a person, they're turning to a device, they're turning to social media, 
They're turning to these things which offer temporary relief. We know, the science is clear, we know that people who spend more time on Facebook suffer higher rates of depression than people who spend less time on Facebook. One billion of us own a smartphone, and we know how addicting it can be. One former Google employee says this is no accident. Indeed, it is by design. Have you noticed if you ever log into uh, Twitter, as an example? So there's an extra delay that you don't know how long it's going to take. It's between two and three seconds, um, where that the number of new notifications on Twitter you have. So why is that there? Well, it makes that into a, what's called a variable schedule reward. It's like a slot machine. So you're playing the slot machine, and there's a time delay, and you're in that time delay, your anticipation's building, and then you get to see how many notifications I get. And so you become more addicted to checking it again the next time. It sounds like there's just a lot of sort of trickery going on here. I, I call it the race to the bottom of the brainstem to, you know, get people's attention at all costs. Never before in history have 50 mostly male 20 to 35 year old designers living in California working at three tech companies influenced how a billion people spend their time. In a 2009 interview with the longtime CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt, who, when asked about all the different ways his company is causing invasions of privacy for hundreds of millions of people around the world, said this. He said, if you're doing something that you don't want other people to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Now, there's all kinds of things to say about that mentality. The first of which is that the people who say that who say that privacy isn't really important, they don't actually believe it. The very same Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, ordered his employees at Google to cease speaking with the online internet magazine CNET after CNET published an article full of personal private information about Eric Schmidt, which it obtained exclusively through Google searches and using other Google products. This same division could be seen with the CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, who in an infamous interview in 2010, pronounced that privacy is no longer a, quote, social norm. Last year, Mark Zuckerberg and his new wife purchased not only their own house, but also all four adjacent houses in Palo Alto for a total of $30 million in order to ensure that they enjoyed a zone of privacy that prevented other people from monitoring what they do in their personal lives. When Facebook was getting going, I had these people who would come up to me um, and they would say, you know, I'm not on social media. And I would say, okay, you know, you will be. And then they would say, they would say, no, 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 no. I value my real life interactions. I value the moment. I value presence and I value intimacy. And I would say, well, you're a conscientious objector. That's okay. You don't have to participate, but you know, we'll get you eventually. <clears throat> and, and, and like, I don't know if I really understood the consequences of what I was saying. <laughs> so. Before we move off this privacy thing, and can you explain what this instant personalization thing was that you did, and why you did it, and what was the what's the value of it to your users? Maybe I should take off the hoodie. Take off the hoodie. Go ahead. You want to? Are you high? Go ahead. Here, can you get someone? Oh, no, it's... We're not even yelling at you. Yeah. Yet. We're not going to yell at you. No, we're of course not. Oh. It is a warm hoodie. Yeah, no, it's a thick hoodie. We, it's, um, it's a company hoodie. We print our mission on the inside. What? Oh, oh my really? God, the inside of the hoodie, everybody. Take a oh. moment. What is it? Making the... Making the world more open and connected. Oh, my God. It's like a secret cool. cult. <laughs> Look at that. Making the world open and connected. Stream graph platform. And this weird symbol in the middle that is probably for the Illuminati question basically of um, what information Facebook's collecting, who they're sending it to, and whether they ever asked me in advance my permission to do that. Is that a fair thing for a user of Facebook to expect? Yes, Senator. I think everyone should have control over how their information is used. And as we've talked about in, in some of the other questions, I think that that is laid out in, in some of the documents. But more importantly, you want to give people control in the product itself. So 
the most important way that this happens across our services is that every day people come to our services to choose to share photos or send messages and every single time they choose to share something um, they're they have a control right there about who they want to share it with but they that level of control is extremely important they certainly know within the facebook pages who their friends are but they may not know as has happened and you've conceded this point in the past that sometimes that information is going way beyond their friends and sometimes people have made money off of sharing that information